Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be um, with you guys today. Um, I'm going to do a, something a little bit different in my sermon today. I'm going to um, I'm going to I'm going to completely nerd out in front of all of you today. And so I I've been wanting to preach a sermon like this for a while, and I figured the best time to do it would be on vacation weekend, Labor Day weekend. So what I'm going to do is just preach to you guys the sermon like I've always been wanting to preach a sermon, like like a total nerd would. So because of this and because of the content that we're going to be covering today, I'm going to read only three verses. My sermon is covering three verses today, and it's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I hear David groaning in the back. Um, This is specifically about um, Paul's command to us to live our lives as a response to God. And so the title of is an unreasonably reasoned response. What would you do if someone gave you an incredible gift? Have you ever received a gift that you had no expectation or no value for before? In the story of the book of Romans, Paul has in the previous 11 chapters been unpacking what is a long and detailed argument for his belief that everybody, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, has brought, been brought from the kingdom of death now into the kingdom of life. And he finishes chapter 11 with this huge statement about God's unbelievable power and love and glory in, for, in, in ways that make zero sense to us. And so chapter 12 begins with this statement of how we should respond as a response to God's gift. When I was in seminary, I had uh, two kids. I was very poor, and I was living in downtown Decatur, the whole Decatur area. So I had a really busy life. I was spending a lot of time studying, and I had received a, um, a Christmas card with a few little checks in it for me and for my family. And this was from my grandmother, Diane. And Diane had been in the habit of sending all of us cards. She prays for us every single day in her, on her prayer list. She's one of these devoted followers of Jesus. And this particular Christmas, um, at the end of the Christmas season, we got an additional card from her, and it wasn't a nice one. It was, she was very upset Because though she had sent all of these gifts to all of her grandkids, and she has like 60 grandkids, she got zero thank you cards as a response. And so what she did is she first described her disappointment and frustration with us for not sending cards back. And then she enclosed for us an envelope with her return address, (laughs) (laughs) pre-stamped, and even some paper that we could write a response on. Okay? She didn't come up with her writing utensil. So, I mean, I think that was a knock against her ingenuity. <laughs> but I remember receiving this card, and my initial response was sort of a joyful laughter. Because she's right. She is so generous to us. She is so constantly giving of her time, of her money, of her energy toward us, that you would think there would be something in order from us as a response and I think that that idea that, that there should be a reasonable response to a gift is the heart and soul of the Christian life. If we're to consider what it means for us to live in light of all of God's mercies, we have to see that our very life itself becomes one constantly writing thank you card. And this is what I want to talk to you guys about today As we unpack these three verses in chapter 12, Paul gives to us the way to respond to this incredible gift of God's mercy, this undeserved act of forgiveness and love and an invitation to be part of an eternal family. So this is what I want to discuss with you guys today. And so we're going to nerd out here in these three verses. First slide. (laughs) 
verse 1 is Paul is calling us to a reasoned worship work. Let me read verse 1 for you again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, one of the things that becomes a problem whenever we read uh, writings from the scriptures, and I've talked to you guys about this a little bit, is that the scriptures are not written in, in English. Did you guys know this? Um, despite some popular statements in some, in some places in the southeast, that the idea that Paul wrote the King James Bible, um, this, this, these letters in the New Testament are written almost entirely in Greek. There's a couple portions of Mark and Matthew where there's a little bit of Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. But the entirety of these books are written in the language of Greek, which is not like English. It's a very different language. So because of this, if you get someone who is writing a very articulate and thoughtful argument, sometimes the way that he writes it or she writes it won't come across clearly in English. So what I want to do is do my favorite thing. I got these degrees when I was an undergraduate in Greek and Latin, which you guys know you can functionally do two things. You can either become a priest or a barista, right? <laughs> and one of those things is more useful than the other. Okay? So what I want to, right, right. So what I want to do is use those, uh, that interest of mine and that skill, which I actually think is, can be useful to us, and unpack what some of these words mean as a way of both giving me the joy of nerding out and reading the scriptures with you, but also to give a very clear picture of what the idea of a reasoned worship work looks like. Verse 1 here. First, Paul commends us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, this word present that he gives us is this Greek word parastasi. You want to try it? Parastasi, okay? And it's this idea, it's not like you make a sacrifice. that You hand over to God for a little bit and then you get it back. This idea is you're setting something up and you're give, handing it over and walking back. You don't get to receive this offering back. It is a permanent gift that you do not receive in return. And I think it's important for us to see because some of the early Christian commentators, when they were reading these scriptures and reflecting back their meaning, they wanted to contrast this idea of a parastasi a gift that is handed over and not received back, from the sort of customary gifts that we saw practiced both in the Jewish temple and in other Greek temples. That this is a gift that is wholly the possession of the giver, the receiver. This gift is wholly the possession of the receiver. When Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, he's saying that our work as gift givers, as thank you givers, are to give ourselves as an offering to God, not expecting anything back in return. Now, what's so profound to me about this is it means that we have to consider that our very lives are supposed to be no longer our possession, but God's possession. Now, secondly, he describes the sort of way that we are a sacrifice using these two words. It's thusion Zoan. You want to try it? Thusion Zoan. See, I even wrote it out. I always forget to do that when we're in Bible study, but I did it today. So what Paul writes here is that we are to be a sacrifice similar to the sort of sacrifice that the Hebrews would offer, but distinctly, the sacrifices in the Hebrew temple were temporary, Right? If you offered a bowl sacrifice or an incense offering or a, a dove, this would be a sacrifice that would be sufficient for a sin or an action, a single moment or group moment of repentance, but then it would no longer be functional. You guys track with what I'm saying? It's sort of like the idea of, uh, of, of paying for a taco, right? I pay for the taco with one exchange of dollars, and as soon as the exchange is done, the taco supply runs out, Right? But this is different. This, the sort of sacrifice that Paul describes here is a living sacrifice. 
okay? Now, it has two meanings for us. One of them is obvious, that our whole life is not one in which we are a sacrifice that dies and are no longer functional, but instead, we're a sacrifice that keeps giving, keeps pouring out, keeps living. It's like, if you'd imagine, like an incense offering that never burns out, or of a blood offering that keeps pouring blood, or of a river that never stops flowing. And in this sense, the word zoan, or uh, 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 living, it has that sense of a sacrifice that is continually operative, that it continues to be an act that pleases God, not just once, but in perpetuity. Paul goes on. He describes the sort of sacrifice that we ought to give. Now listen to this. He says that this sort of sacrifice is supposed to be eo arestan. You want to say that with me? Eo arestan, okay? It means pleasing or acceptable. I like to tell this story often. Too bad my wife's in the nursery. Um, about the first time I got my wife flowers, I got her tulips, Okay? Some of you guys know the story. Dot's already laughing, okay? And I learned real quick that day, tulips were a no-no as an act of love to my wife because it didn't please her. I gave that gift. It cost me money. It cost me time. But when I gave it to her, she said, no, thank you, okay? And we know this. Sometimes we have received gifts from someone that we, we received the gift from like, this? Okay. When we give our gifts to God, our intent in the gift giving is not just to give God anything, not just any sacrificial gift will do, but specifically God wants us to live and work in a way that's intended to please God himself. I'm going to talk about in a little bit the, the problem that this creates for us as Christians, but next passage. And then lastly, and this is sort of the, the heart and soul of the sermon I'm talking to you today. It talks about the reasonableness of our worship. Is that our life in the self-giving is supposed to be a, um, a latrion logikane. Or in, in, in Greek, it's supposed to be something like a spiritual worship exercise. Oh, let me just, just unpack this for just a second. What I am focusing on in these two words, the, this verse, at the end of verse one, there's this declaration that all of this work, this presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice, is a spiritual worship. Okay, that's how it's translated in our Bibles. The problem is, is that this translation is highly, um, it's highly interpretive. The, the word that we use to describe uh, worship, first of all, is the word that we would use for a service that we'd provide, okay? It doesn't mean the concept of adoration. The word here is latria, latria. It means an action that we bring forward as an offering. And so this could be a way that you live your life. This could be a song that you sing. This could be the very act of preparing a sacrifice itself. The point is, is that this would be a service of worship. It's a set of actions that we provide on God's behalf to describe how much God is valuable to us. But what's even more confusing is the word that we use to translate spiritual. <laughs> it's, in Greek, it's the Greek word logikos. Try this one, logikos, right? Where we get the word logical, okay? And it's a really hard word to translate within this context because although spiritual is in some ways a really good translation, what it means is that our worship must be reasoned. It must be something that follows a logical order that makes sense. Now, the brunt of my sermon is going to be unpacking this very concept, okay? But I want to just talk about this idea of reasonableness because I think reason has sort of gone out the window within our culture in recent years. That when we... For instance, when someone tries to make a reasoned argument, it means that the grounds of the argument and the conclusion of the argument all follow a simple, reasonable process from beginning to end, that they fall within the same terms. So for instance, if I'm talking about the value of a specific set of musical notes, okay, I wouldn't all of a sudden use the concept of color to describe the length of a musical note, right? 
These are ideas that are not reasonable in reconciliation to one another. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Okay. So the question becomes, if we're to offer a reasonable work of worship or service of worship to God, we have to ask ourselves the question, what sort of reason does it align to? What is the mathematical equations we're using to determine whether or not our worship is reasonable? Is it making sense what I'm saying? No. No, okay. We have to ask ourselves this question, okay? Whose reason are we using when we determine if our worship is reasonable? Now, I was trying really hard to come up with a really good way to translate that phrase in a way that we could all understand and make sense, but I found a translator, actually the guy who sort of turned me on to Anglicanism, he gave me this, uh, this translation in his New Testament translation. It's a guy named Tom Wright, Bishop Tom Wright. He translates the last little bit of this passage like this. Try this next. Is it this? There we go. Worship in this sort of way brings your mind into line with God's. What does reasonable worship mean? The reasonable worship that Paul's calling us to do at the end of verse 1 is one in which the way that we worship is in line with how God intends us to worship, a way that pleases him, a way that assesses that he is our true judge. Now, within that little framework, what I want to do is present this idea within the broader context of the core values of good Samaritan Anglican Church. You guys probably know this by now, But the heart and soul of our community is to be people who, as individuals, are united with God in worship. This is the heart of what it means to be a Christian. You are a worshiping tool. God has created you to be a worship instrument on God's behalf. Actually, every single part of you is made to play this one song, God is awesome, over and over and over. And and if you've read the scriptures with me, this is sort of the the really clear point, okay? What are the angels in heaven doing right now, right? They're just praising God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In a few minutes, we're gonna join in that song with them, okay? And so this is part of this, what I think is a confusion, is our very um, existence, as creatures, is one in which we are commissioned to be living worship instruments, okay? Or to use a a recent song that just was released a couple weeks ago, that we are created to be praise creators. That everything within us is intended to be a creation of praise. So all of this has this final takeaway that I want to give to you in a sort of summary way of describing it. Verse 1 says to us that our response to God's mercy is a life of worship. Our response to God's mercy is a life of worship. But as I hope it might be clear in the way that I put this argument together. It might, might, might not be. There's problems with our reason, <laughs> okay? And there's also problems with the idea that we would live in such a way that would be pleasing to God, Okay? Go back to the tulips reference. In order for me to understand that my tulips offering to my wife was not an acceptable offering, I had to do what? Listen to her say to me, I don't like those. I had to get over the fact that I spent my money and it didn't make her happy, didn't get the result I wanted. And so as a result, what I needed to do was shut up and listen and change my frame of reference. So let me ask you guys, in that light of thinking, why, as praise creators, creatures that are intended to worship, why do we, as instruments intended for worship, draw our worship to other things other than God? Think about it. Why do we worship ourselves? Or why do we worship Taylor Swift? (laughs) Or our children? Or, I mean, you pick, you know, David's into... He calls it football, but it looks more like soccer to me. You know, it's, it's why, do we, why do we obsess ourselves in the worship of things that are not about God? Well, I, I think ultimately 
This is because there's something that's deeply out of alignment within our environment. And it's causing our instrument selves to play out of tune. And so as a result, we start playing songs in a way that don't fall into the key of praise. Now, I have a guitar here, okay? And I like to play it, or playing a little bit strong. I like to hit the strings from time to time. And one of the things that I've done is noticed that this guitar is supposed to be an E chord. It's actually D sharp chord, okay? If you just move one little string a little bit, sounds a little bit off. Or if you move another string out of the way, everything very quickly starts to completely sound out of whack. And I think this is what happens to us, right? We live in a world where we're being constantly told, you can tune those strings however you want. Those are your strings, aren't they? And as a result, there's a whole song that we're intended to play that's out of tune with what our creaturely nature intends for us to play. Now, as a result, we have to have some sort of response to this problem. We have to have some sort of response to this difficult reality. If we're going to understand and observe what is actually acceptable and pleasing, we have to somehow know how to please God. We have to know how to live in a way that pleases God. So with that framework of our, that problem in our minds, let's move over now to verse 2. Paul writes this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, when Paul uses this word conformed, he contrasts it from the word that he uses later, transformed. Now, the word conformed is Try it with me. Ooh, is it on there? Next, next slide. Yes. Okay. Suskematsu. Try it with me. Suskematsu. Okay. And it's the idea of putting on a new trendy fashion line. Like, do you guys ever go to Target? You ever been to Target before? And tar- thought you'd never been there. It's like a whole different set of new clothes they come out with in the spring. Okay. And as soon as, what is it? Um, August, no, what is, uh, what, when does summer begin? June 20, as soon as June 21st hits, all those spring fashion trends end and you got to wear the summer, summer fashion trends. And then once September 21st hits, you got to transition from summer fashion to fall fashion. This is the idea of us living in a place of conforming to the world. It's not stable, it's not consistent. It's a only skin deep problem. It's temporary, it's thick. It's fickle. It's a trend that's here today. It's gone tomorrow. Now, the word that he contrasts it with is this word metamorpho. You try that with me? Metamorpho. Does it sound familiar to you? Metamorphosis. This is the word that we use in the scriptures to describe Jesus's transfiguration. Okay? When Jesus was transfigured before the disciples, it's not like he put on different holy clothes, right? But it was as if his very substance so completely changed that you could see who he really was, his divine nature. Now, I want to make two observations about these words. One is that we have to consider the longevity of this sort of change. Do we want to be the sort of individuals that are constantly giving way to every new fashion? That every time a new political idea or philosophical conundrum comes up, we find our ways, we find ourselves reacting and responding to every single news cycle with fervor and ardor and anguish. I had this observation when I was working in a different denomination. Um, I knew many priests who were very interested in making sure that every morning, Sunday morning, after their sermon was already written, they would make sure they looked on the news to make sure they didn't need to change their sermon. Have you guys heard of this before? (laughs) I just know too many priests, I think. And what I find so problematic about this idea is it seems to give way to the, 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 
the concept that the way that we preach and the way that we ought to live ought to give way to what our culture tells us is important. Think about that for a second. If every single thing that we do and conform our lives to is constantly about our culture, who are we actually worshiping? And one thing I've discovered about culture, it doesn't matter how liberal or conservative you are today, tomorrow that liberal or conservative nature is going to be out of date. So one thing that we have to do is consider, what am I changing for? How long is this change or this transformation supposed to last in me? But second, a second observation I want to make about these two words is I want to just point out that they are passive in nature. Do you see this? It doesn't say, do not conform to this world. It doesn't say, don't tra- but transform yourself. What does it say? Do not be conformed. Meaning, you're not the one who's doing the conforming. You're not the one who's doing the transforming. And I want to say this, but I'll point this out a little bit further later. But what Paul's pointing to is the idea that you and I are constantly receiving pressure to change from the outside. And you are going to fall into some pressure. You are going to change the way that you do something because of outside influence. The question is, what you allow to give influence in your person, in your thinking. Now, when Paul describes the nature of this transformation, this metamorphosis, this transfiguration, he uses the word renewal or renovation. But in Greek, it says, it sounds like this, anakinosis, anakinosis. It's this idea of you completely doing a kitchen remodel, Right? Think about your kitchen. Maybe the faucet doesn't work very well. Or it's got vinyl flooring. It needs to be outdated. It needs to be changed over and replaced with a nice solid tile. What God wants to do is bring about a renewing, a total renovation in your person. And the singular location of that work, of that renewal, of that transformation is the noose. Now, the noose is the location in your body where we locate the concept of rationality. In, the, uh, in, in, our, in our world, in our way of thinking, we tend to think of our brains as the, sor- of, as the center of focus, okay? In the Hebrew world, your heart was the center of your logical f- faculties, okay? But what I want to say is what Paul's statement here is to us is that if our minds need to be transformed, this means we can't trust something. Our minds. If our minds require a complete transformation, and not just a shallow, skin-deep transformation, but a whole renovation, this means that our reason center is completely unreasonable. That if we're going to live in a way that actually comports to God's priorities, we have to just assume that there's something broken within our brains. Now, I want to make one other observation about this. That although in our translation in English it says, uh, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your minds, in Greek the word mind here is not in the plural. It's a singular idea. Y'all need to be transformed by y'all's renewed mind. Now, I think this is really important that we hear, okay? Because Paul's not pointing to the idea of you in your own, on your own in isolation, needing to go through your own personal brain journey, (laughs) okay? He's saying that we all together have a shared mind. We all together have a shared rationality. And that we are responsible for not only conforming our minds, but the minds of our whole community into a new way of reasoning that aligns with Jesus. Now, if you know anything about the concepts of group think or mob mentality, you can speak to the legitimacy of this statement that we in groups think differently than we do as individuals. It's one of the reasons why the church can be such a holy and wonderful gift in creation, but also an incredible source of evil. 
that we have a shared singular mind and we allow the influence of others within our community to share that mind or distract this mind. Now, when that mind renewal takes place, I'm continuing here in verse two, what this gives us the ability to do is discern what is the will of God. Now, first of all, I want to talk about the word discern because I hear people use the word discern all the time. I don't think anybody knows what it means. (laughs) In Greek, the word discern is this word, dokimatso. Try that with me. Dokimatso. Now, to discern or dokimatso does not mean you go through like a series of of, uh, best case scenarios in your brain, okay? Dokimatso is a scientific test. Dokimatso is a series of arguments that experience refutations, okay? It literally means you are testing to prove that something is true or not true, okay? And I just want to just talk about this for just a brief second. There's one case in... um, in the book of Luke, oh, I didn't write it down. It's Luke chapter 14, where some, Jesus asks someone to follow him, and that person who he asked to follow him responds to Jesus by saying this statement, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to dokimatso them. I go to prove them, test them, okay? In this sense, the word dokimatso is intended to describe someone who actually assesses and tests whether or not God's truth is true. God's power is true. That when our minds are transfigured, we have the capacity to ascertain whether or not something is in line with God or something is not. And it's not just a brain question. It's something that we test. It's one of the things I talk about regularly when I'm reading the scriptures with people is in the gospels, Jesus does not believe that you will simply believe him based on faith. Do you guys know that? Jesus does not believe that you are just going to believe him with blind faith. Jesus proves to everybody that in order for someone to believe in him to some degree, they need to be able to test and prove that what he says is true. Think about the Gospels. What's the thing that Jesus does when he travels through the countryside? He proclaims his message And then he backs up the truth of his statements with what? Miracles. He drives out demons. He heals the sick. He transforms a couple loaves of bread into lots and lots of loaves of bread. This is useful to us, okay? Because I think we live in a world where we somehow have fallen prey to this belief that if our faith is really good for nothing, we should keep doing it anyways. No, no. If your faith does not result in you becoming a changed person or people around you being healed spiritually, intellectually, physically, don't do it. It's literally worthless. That the whole point of our faith is not just to build a Christian community. It's not simply to wear funny clothes or have a bunch of funny phrases that we, the church, say. The point is that our faith proves God's existence. You see where I'm getting at in the statement? We need to do testing in order to prove what God's will is. You've heard me say it before. If Bible study is the class, then the work of the church and community is the laboratory, okay? We can test and prove whether or not God's work is alive in us because of how we live. I'm going to skip the next phrase, will. And then just jump on to this sort of last part of verse 2. The whole point of this passage is that Paul is trying to describe for us and emphasize for us that we need to have a change of the reason in our minds. That our mindfulness, the place that we put our energy and our minds onto, should be about what pleases God and is fitting to God. And he uses this last phrase at the end that we need to focus our heads on the things that are good and acceptable and perfect, okay? This is actually the concept of how we grow as rational faith provers. Good, acceptable, and perfect are the testing and proving of a perfected worship instrument. So to use the example of the out-of-tune guitar, okay? Okay. 
I can tell that something is back in tune. Come on, tune quicker. Tune quicker. I can tell that something is back in tune when it matches up with the other notes on the instrument. And if it doesn't match up, it's not pleasing. It's not good. It's not acceptable. Hear that? Two strings at once. Indistinguishable from one another. This is what Christ is calling us to consider as we live our lives of faith. That we continue to grow in our lives as Christians. That our offerings begin as good and grow to acceptable until they become perfect. And I've described this for us as Christians before. And I just want to maybe harness what I think is a, is a misunderstanding in my request. As your priest... Once you enter into a life of journeying of faith, you're not done yet. Did you know that? I don't know if I've communicated that clearly. That the life of a Christian is one of growth, okay? It's one where you begin by knocking on the doors of heaven, and then as you walk through those doors, you live a life in a trajectory of constant spiritual maturity. And actually, that your way of living starts as a good offering. But then it becomes an offering that is actually pleasing. And then as you continue and grow as a working Christian, the end result is a life of complex of completeness, or we use the word perfection. Now, when I say this, I hope you don't get the misunderstanding. I don't have a specific agenda for any single one of you of how you grow spiritually, okay? Some of you guys are going to grow in some ways. Some of you guys are going to grow in other ways, okay? But here's what I care about, that you grow. And so you, right now, um, I am really emphasizing within this church, um, emphasizing the concept of growing in spiritual gifts, emphasizing the importance of growing in charismatic ministry. And hear me say, some, some of y'all are hearing this and getting on board with it, and you're experiencing the transformation, Okay, but if we get done with this and all we ever do is just more charismatic ministry, we're not continuing to grow. We have to find other avenues in which we need to grow, in which we need to mature. And so this is what I want to say to all of you. Let's say you see some person in this room. Let's say it's Asher, right? And you think, I'll never be as spiritually mature as Asher. If that's so, can we talk afterward because we got some (laughs) brain problems, okay? But let's just say that's you, okay? If that's the case, you're off on the wrong foot just to start, okay? This is not about you growing into someone else. This is about you growing into who Christ has made you to be. So given that, don't look at the end in mind. Look instead, what am I going to do today that's going to allow me to move from good to acceptable? What am I going to do that's going to allow me to move from acceptable to perfect? How do I grow in the perfection of, that God is calling me to be as a worship instrument. Okay. Let me wrap up verse two. The whole takeaway of this idea is that we become a people who need a mind reboot in order to work out what God wants. Okay? If we're going to live our lives in complete surrender to who God has called us to be, we have to acknowledge that we need to completely alter our way of thinking so that we can understand and test what God wants. Now, within that framework, that's good, but you might notice we've got a problem right off the bat, okay? Because even though we we accept the idea that we have to grow, that we have to use God's reason, there's still a problem, which is all of our measurements for how we understand what God wants are broken because we are the judge in those situations. And we are using our human judgment. And so it's because of this that I want to conclude by focusing on verse 3. Paul writes in verse 3, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each 
according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now the first word, the sort of he, the, the key word that I want to just sit on with you is the Greek word huperfronein. Try it. Huperfronein, which literally means to be arrogant. Or in a, in a sort of, if you're going to pick the word apart, the word huper is where we get the word uber or super from. And then your frain, or the thing that you use to, to, uh, to, to frain with, is, is when you um, use like your stomach or your diaphragm to sort of stick out your chest, right? It's when you overestimate your ability to estimate. It's when you overthink your capacity to think. It's when you highly consider your own considerations. Don't spend time thinking about yourself at all. Instead, what God is calling us to do in this passage is to reassess value based on an entirely different measurement, and it's the measurement of faith. We should be thinking about ourselves using faith as the metric, just like God has given to us. Let me ask you the question. What does it mean for us to be a good person? Does it mean you have a certain amount of money in your bank account? Does it mean mean when you take those online IQ tests that you get a certain number? Does it mean you are a person who's highly influential, whose kids have multiple houses, whose grandkids are going to really nice colleges? Let me ask you this question. Let me ask it a different way. Do you think that St. Paul was a good person? Okay, St. Paul... You guys know about his story? He died for his faith. We think he was beheaded by the Roman emperor Nero. We think that his testimony itself completely transformed the Western world, and he lived as a sacrifice. He was stoned almost to death. He was whipped almost to death three times. He was shipwrecked over and over and over again. You might notice Paul never calls himself a good person. Actually, the opposite. He calls himself the chief of sinners. And there's two times in the New Testament, teenagers, close your ears, right? There's two times in the New Testament that Paul actually uses swear words. And both times are in reference to his status and his accomplishments. That's how much Paul values himself. I just want to give to you guys what I think is a useful way of reordering how we understand and how we judge is that God wants us to use only the measure of faith as an assessment of our nearness to him, and that's it. He doesn't want you to judge yourself. He only wants you to allow him to judge you. The takeaway in verse 3 is that God is trying to give us a mind reboot. That's a repeat of of, of verse two. This is what it is. What what this is supposed to say is, we need to set aside our judgment and our measurements of judgment in favor of a life of faith. So let me conclude. The life of a walking praise instrument is one in which we re-understand and reassess our identities around who God has called us to be, using the measurement of faithfulness to God. God wants to recalibrate within our mindsets what it means to be valuable only in his eyes. So let me ask you guys that question. Is the faith life that you're living out actually resulting in greater maturity? Is it resulting in you having greater love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, for a world outside of our world that is broken and in need of redemption? Or are you angrier? Are you more bitter? Are you finding it harder and harder to serve your neighbor? Do you find yourself getting easily offended and defensive? 
If that's so, you need a mind transformation. You need to let go of your own judgment. Don't conform to the mentality that your intelligence or your success is a measure of your goodness. Instead, let us change our life, living a life instead to surrender. Amen. Thank you.